Hello, everyone. We welcome you for tonight's talk, New Discoveries Along the Suanchang Trail, Where the Buddha Cut His Hair, by Deepak Anand. This is a very interesting topic for those who goes for Buddhist pilgrimage. If I ask you, have you ever been to this place where the Buddha cut his hair? And I'm sure that the answer will be no. No, why? Because this place is lost to the forest and it's lost in history, if not for the discovery by our special speaker tonight. Now, his guide and reference has been from the seventh century records of Venerable Xuanzang, who traveled on food uh, from China to India. So Deepak uh, retraced Xuanzang's trail in Northern India and revealed to us this site which he has just discovered. This pilgrimage, I myself leads Buddhist pilgrimage and uh, very often a Buddhist pilgrimage involves four major pilgrimage sites. And this was mentioned by the Buddha in the, the um, uh, in, a, in a sermon, uh, Parinibbana Sutta, uh, where he says that we should visit his birthplace, which is Lumbini, place of enlightenment, Budgaya, preaching at the first sermon, Saranath, and passing away at Kushinara. And if you want to be a bit more adventurous, and uh, you can actually include four other places of miracles. This is Sravasti, uh, the place for the twin miracle, Rajgir, where the Buddha subdued the elephant called Nalagiri. Sankasya, the place where the Buddha descended from heaven after teaching his mother uh, in the Tabatimsa heaven, Abhidhamma. Yeah? And Veshali, where honey was offered from a monkey. Now, these places were discovered uh, by the archaeological works of the British archaeologists in the 19th century. So this was like 1800s, 18 something. And they also went by the records of Xuanzang and uh, Fa Xian. This was the two Chinese pilgrims who have written some accounts of, of what they found in India. But uh, are these the only places uh, worthy of Buddhist pilgrimage? How about the other places associated with the Buddha, but has been lost through time? Because Buddhism disappeared from India about um, 800 years ago. But even before that, some of these places disappeared when Buddhism was no longer practiced in those areas. But how did we know where they are? So really the, uh, Buddha, uh, the British archeologists uh, have identified some sites and those are the sites that we are visiting. But over a century, nobody tried to find new places for us to discover, places for pilgrimage, right? So tonight we're going to talk about our speaker is going to talk about the place where the Buddha shaved his head as a symbol of renunciation from a princely life to adopt the life of a wandering Sramana. And that actually, he set out on his spiritual journey. And we know that six years later, he became the fully enlightened Buddha. We are very fortunate that for Buddhist pilgrimage, we have two historical figures who have left some signposts for us to discover these holy places. I think the first one, our tribute and our thanks to Emperor Ashoka, who lived about 250 years after the Buddha. He identified these sites. After he became Buddhist, he identified the sites and he built a stupa and sometimes uh, erect a pillar. So by these, we can actually identify the places. Now, the second uh, person is, comes by the name of uh, Venerable Suan Zhang. And here I would like to share screen. Okay, this is Venerable Suan Zhang, 602 to 664, uh, Common Era. He had a remarkable record, having traveled the Sri from China to India and visited all the places associated with the Buddha, which he recorded in the great Tang record of the Western region. Now, Suan Zhang was really determined and fearless because he traveled from China to India in order to study under the great masters at Nalanda, his other mission was also to collect the scriptures and the Buddha relics and statues in order to bring them back to China. His journey was really truly epic in every sense. 
because he faced with danger and difficulty, and he traveled almost alone in the vast dry Gobi Desert that has extreme uh, temperature, that became a death trap for travelers. And there was also an imperial addict uh, to kill him, to catch him, to, uh, to catch him, uh, to capture him, and to shoot also, uh, because he had defied, uh, he has not obtained the permission from the emperor to travel out of the country. He was at the door of death many times. Uh, his first encounter was when the water bottle fell from his hands in the desert and he spent about the next four or five days wandering around and he almost died. He fell on the sand and cried out to Kuan Yin. He was no longer afraid for himself, really. He's not afraid to die, but he asked Kuan Yin to help because he says, Kuan Yin, please help me. I would like to go to India to, uh, to collect uh, scriptures to bring back to China. Uh, please help me. And after that, he's no longer afraid of death and he faced death a couple of times. Yeah, there was an avalanche that hit his, uh, uh, you know, while he was cruising, crossing some snowy mountain peaks. He was being captured by robbers who was about to kill he together with his group. And he was almost burned on stake as a human sacrifice. It took three years for Sun Chang to reach India. And for the most part, he made this journey alone. It was a miracle that he survived in the deserts, in the mountains of ice and snow, in the desolate plains, in the heat and sandstorm. So when he got to India alive and in one piece, that indeed was a great miracle. His journey took 17 years before he returned back to China. But the wonderful thing about Bernabal Suen Chang is that he will travel to every place of Buddhist interest and make detailed notes about them, <laughs> all right? So when he traveled in India, he found, tried to find the places associated with the Buddha, recorded them in terms of directions with such great precision that we can almost identify. It is almost like Sun Chang, 600 AD, I would almost came to know that when Buddhism has disappeared in India, would he be able to give enough direction so that people are able to discover these places which is lost through time, all right? So um, uh, let me just give you the context. Tonight's talk was where the Buddha shaved his head. Um, you know, after the Bodhisattva, the Buddha-to-be, uh, saw the four sites, he was actually seriously thinking about renunciation. On the day of the renunciation, he spent a whole day in the park, lost in his thoughts. And about sunset, King Sododana, his father, heard that Princess Yashodara has just given birth to the son. Of course, the king rejoiced and said, you have to bring this news to the prince. You know, maybe the prince might give up his idea of renouncing because the king also knows that the prince is thinking about renouncing. But when he heard, when the prince heard this news, he said, oh no, an eclipse has arisen, an eclipse in Rahula. And he says, a fatter is created. So it is something that was going to tie him down. So the prince knew that that is the night that he would have to renounce. He returned to the palace in splendor and he laid on his royal couch and the beautiful uh, dancers and musicians came to entertain him. But he was lost in thoughts. And at that time he was not interested in the performance at all. He fell asleep on the couch. So when the, when the musicians and the dancers saw that he was asleep, they stopped performing and they were also tired and they slept, you know. And when the prince woke up, he saw that they were sleeping in different positions. There was saliva dripping from the chin. The hair was disheveled. And when he looked at the car, oh, he looks at the, the performers, they actually looked like corpses in a cemetery. And the palace that he was living with was like a house on fire and he has to get out. So he went to the stable and woke up Chana, who was his charioteer. And he told Chana that this will be the night of the great renunciation. And says, Chana, go and harness Kantaka, his favorite horse. Now the prince before leaving went to the bedroom in order to have a glimpse of Yashodara and also the newly born son. And Yashodara having given birth to the baby was, was really happy like a mother, you know, just having given birth to the son but her arms was being uh, covered over the face of Rahula. And the prince, the Buddha-to-be, could not see the face of the sun. But he dare not lift the hands of Yashodara for fear that it might awaken her. 
And he says to himself that he will see the sun again after attaining enlightenment. Then he walked across the courtyard. The whole palace was very quiet. And he saw that Chana was waiting with Kantaka. It was a beautiful horse with great strength and speed. And he mounted on this horse together with Kantaka. The two of them actually mounted on the same horse. And they rode out of the eastern gate of Kapilabastu. The prince was 29 years old. He was in the peak of youth. And he, when he took the last look at the city, he says, I will not enter the city again before I have crossed over and gained the power over old age and death. And he rode forth in great renunciation, giving up worldly power that was in his grasp to find a way uh, out of universal suffering. Now the sources tell us that the Buddha-to-be rode past three kingdoms, so he's already out of the territory of the of the Sakyans. And, uh, and then they came to the river Anoma. Anoma means not shallow. So it was deep, deep water. And um, the horse leapt over the river water. And then the prince and the Chana came down to the sandy bank. Then the prince got down and said, Chana, my friend, these are the ornaments. You take the ornaments and Kantaka, return back to the kingdom. I want to become a monk. And Chana looked at the prince with, with such great shock. And the tears were flowing down his face. He says, no, I too want to be a monk. But the Buddha to be says, no, Chana, this is not the time. You are not destined to be a monk. Go, take my ornaments and a horse. And the king had, the, the prince had long hair. And he thinks it's not proper for a monk to have long hair. So the future Buddha took the sword in his right hand and cut his hair and reflected that the clothes that he's wearing are the very fine silk, you know, from, from uh, you know, that, that uh, a princely garb. And then he exchanged his robes, uh, his, his uh, clothes for the robes of a monk. And he says to Chana, 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 go back, inform my parents I'm in good health. So, of course, this was a very sad moment for Chana and the horse as they parted ways. And the horse, Kantaka, could not believe what is happening. There are actually two accounts. In one account, Kantaka was so heartbroken that he actually fell and died. And uh, from a Tibetan record, the charioteer and the horse returned back to Kapalabasu, but it took them seven days. So Kantaka didn't even want to run. And after that, upon reaching Kapilavastu, Kantaka died, and a mound was built over his body. So that was the context of this talk. Now let me introduce to you the, our special speaker tonight. His name is Deepak Anand. He's a Buddhist pilgrimage explorer and uh, passionate about uh, writing about the revival of the ancient Buddhist pilgrimage in India. He received his bachelor's of engineering at the Shanti Lal Shah College of engineering in Gujarat and as his MBA at the Punjab University. And he's published a few books and articles. Uh, some of the books are Xuan Zhang, about Xuan Zhang. Xuan Zhang, Footsteps That Time Cannot Erase and the Pilgrimage Legacy of Xuan Zhang. So he really had done a lot of study of Xuan Zhang and very passionate about Xuan Zhang. And he has actually traveled on foot 750 kilometers. I think by now it's more than this now. He has gone on foot at a grassroots level, visiting villages and being enriched by Xuan Chang's uh, eyewitness account of the sites that are connected with, with the Buddha. And along the way, he received food and shelter from the people. This is really the custom of India. And then we know that how a tramana in India could survive without, without having food. They just travel and household will just give them food and, and some kind of shelter. This is the tradition of India, okay? So tonight's uh, talk will be about something special. This place where the Buddha shaved his hair is completely lost. And the record that we have was from Xuanzang in the 600 uh, uh, CE. And uh, our speaker will tell you about his account on how he discovered this place. All right. So maybe let me just uh, uh, invite uh, uh, Deepak uh, to, uh, to give his talk. Deepak. Hello, uh, Dr. Thanks a lot. Good evening to all of you, all the viewers. Thank you. 
Uh, thanks for this opportunity, Dr. V. Yes, so can I share my screen? Yes, yes. Deepak is speaking from Patna. Patna was the old capital of Ashoka called Pataliputra. And before that, it's called Pataligamma during the Buddha's time. So he happens to be in the city right now. And this is, as you know, it's the rainy season in India. So it's raining. Eh? All right, Deepak. Should I start, sir? Yes, yes, of course, Deepak. Thank you. Thanks for this opportunity, Dr. V. So. I mean, this is the stupa uh, on your left hand side. That uh, is it fine? Yeah. So on the on the left side of uh, on the screen, you can see this is a mound. This is mound which I think is the uh, this is the mound which I have identified on the basis of Shrenzang the place where Buddha cut his hair. So the idea is, the thought is, why Why do I think, I mean, why Why I think that this is the mount, this is the place where Buddha cut his hair. Based on, basically it's based on Shenzang uh, records that I have uh, reached this place. So let me share with you the whole story of how the discoveries were made in, like, you know, in the Gangetic plain about all this uh, Buddhist places of pilgrimage. So starting from like, you know, uh, this is Sankasa. So Sankasa was discovered by Cunningham in 1842. So uh, this was, I mean, at that time, the geography was not properly known and all the places mentioned by Fashian and Shrenzang in their travel accounts, like all the places, their names were changed. But uh, this place, Sankasa, so Sankasa was the only place which uh, continued with the same name. I mean, the, uh, the place was, the name changed, but I mean, it remained the same. I mean, this, this was the place where the name, uh, name remained same. So Cunningham, when he went there in 1842, he found this Ashokan uh, capital, elephant uh, capital there. So on the basis of that, he could uh, identify that uh, this is the place uh, where uh, Buddha descended from heaven, Sankisa. But uh, from Sankisa, uh, Shenzang went to many places, like you know, he went to Kosa, Ayodhya, and Vishoka, uh, Vishakha, where Vishoka, and then from there he went to Shravasti. So it took like you know 21 years to identify Shravasti based on Shenzang and Fashian uh, travel accounts, basically because the geography was not properly understood at that time. They, they, they didn't have proper maps and names of all the places were changed. Like Shravasti of ancient time, it became Sahit and Mahit. So this British explorer, especially Cunningham, he faced lots of difficulty in identifying this place. So the why I'm putting up all this thing is because it was very difficult to, this uh, explorers at that time, they faced lots of difficulty in identifying the places. So once the Shravasti was identified in 1863, this whole area was dense forest. I mean, uh, at the time of uh, British uh, explorers, when they were exploring, it was dense forest. It was like, you know, everything was wild. So uh, this was this is how, you know, Cunningham identified Shravasti when he was doing some digging, some excavation. So he discovered this uh, image of Bodhisattva, uh, Buddha. And this image, on this image, there was an inscription saying uh, Shravasti. So on the basis of this uh, image, Shravasti was identified in 1863. So from Shravasti, uh, Shrenzang and Fashi and both of them, they went to Kapilavastu and uh, uh, Lumbini and the places of other two Buddha, Karakachunda Buddha and Kanak Buddha, Kanakmuni Buddha. And from Lumbini, both of these pilgrims, they went to Ramagrama. So uh, Cunningham, uh, based on his exploration, he did some guesswork and he descended little south and he made some identification of uh, Kapilvastu, Ramagrama, you can see all these places. I mean, these are the, this uh, orange line, this is the line which, is, which was followed by Cunningham in identifying the places mentioned by Shrenzang. So like, you no, know, uh, this is, uh, uh, this is Nagar, he identified as Kapilvastu. Uh, similarly, I mean, uh, Karakchandu Buddha and all these places, this, uh, this line, this line is basically the path taken by Cunningham in making identification based on Shrenzang and Fashion accounts. So after 10, 15 years after him, his assistant Carlyle, he took the similar path and he like, you know, re-examined the Cunningham's identification and he proposed new identification. So this green line is the identification made by Carlyle. So again, 
this was in 1877 so in 1890s three ashokan pillars were discovered here in 1890s ashokan pillars were discovered here like you know one was at gothiawa one was at uh, nigliawa and another was at uh, rumandi that is lumbini so this ashokan pillar shrenzang mentions about this ashokan pillars which was uh, which marked the places of karakchanda buddha kanakmani buddha and the uh, birthplace of gautama buddha so now all this identification which were made by cunningham they proved to be wrong so uh, cunningham made identification of rama grama and the hair cutting stupa where buddha cut his hair and where he exchanged robes and the place where he sent back chandaka so all those places which cunningham and kalal identified at this place they were wrong so now these are the ashokan pillars which were discovered by uh, in 1890s by uh, british explorers and uh, some nepalese explorers and uh, indian explorers also so based on this exploration these three uh, ashokan pillars were identified so all the previous exp- uh, identifications done by alexander cunningham and kalal was wrong so now to look for rama grama and other places like you know places where place where from rama grama shrenzang went to the place where buddha sent back chandaka and uh, after that he cut his hair so all those places were now not here but somewhere here this side so based on this identification uh, now this is the, this is the map like you know from shravasti this this was the identification proposed by cunningham and carly so this were wrong so now this the new identification which were made in 1890s based on ashokan pillar so rama grama chandaka stupa and hair cutting stupa they were to be uh, For, to be discovered in this this direction so based on uh, the new identification william hoy proposed rama grama this is in nepal so this was identified on the basis of the new identification made by um, uh, in 1890s the ashokan pillar identif- the ashokan pillars which were discovered so from here from rama grama uh, shrenzang and fashian both of them shrenzang Uh, travel hundred li and fashion travel four yojan, so it comes at approximately twenty to thirty kilometer or I mean up to thirty five kilometers. So both of them they travelled in the east direction, and uh, so I mean this is the travel of Shrenzang and Fashian from Tilarakot, that is uh, Kapilavastu city. From here uh, they went to Lumbini, and uh, so this is the travel. I mean this is the uh, route of uh, Shrenzang and Fashian. This is the trail, the, the track which both of them they took. So from Rama Grama, both of them they went to. Uh, this place uh, where Ch- uh, chandaka where uh, bodhisattva siddhartha sent back the chandaka and then after that he uh, the whole story just after we shared with us so now the point is i was looking for this places somewhere on the east of this side so the other literature also mentions about i mean there are many biographical text of uh, buddha and all this text they mention about uh, this great renunciation in very detail so uh, they share the same story in different details like you know abhishkramana sutra they, it mentions that buddha crossed uh, bodhisattva siddhartha on that night of uh, ashala punima he crossed rama grama so from kapilavastu traveling uh, it's like 65 kilometers so he crossed rama grama so next uh, pali sources burmese account and lalit vistra says uh, siddhartha reached on the uh, at the bank of anoma so uh, basically in uh, i mean it is being believed that uh, narayani river gandak river Gand- narayani is the name of gandak river in uh, nepal so it is believed that uh, gandak is uh, the present day gandak is anoma of ancient times pali sources and uh, nidana katha says that uh, river was very wide i mean it was a wide river where i mean buddha with chandaka it leaped and burmese sources say that kanthaka the horse uh, once it leaped uh, so i mean it landed on a i mean like sand bank I mean, it was sand. Uh, it was a uh, sand bank. So, and then Lalit Vistra and Abhishekramana Sutra says that there was a memorial stupa uh, erected at that place. Even Shrenzang and Fashian says that where uh, Buddha said, uh, Bodhisattva Siddhartha said goodbye to uh, Chandaka, uh, Chandaka and uh, Kanthaka. So there was a stupa built there by Ashoka. So all these things, like you know, reaches us to this uh, Gandak River. and on this bank so this is river gandak and it's like you know very wide and it's uh, i mean forest everywhere and uh, so my guess was that uh, it should be somewhere here like you know 
this gandak river this is the place where gandak river comes to plain from the uh, hills so this gandak river is very wide here like this area is very wide this is the modern embankment which was created some 40 50 years ago so otherwise this was like you know this river was from here it was like you know this is the there were many uh, like you know this river has taken many courses in last few centuries so my guess was that i should find this uh, stupa somewhere in this area so this is bihar this is nepal this is uttar pradesh so uh, both of them uh, shrenzang and foshan says that uh, there was an ashokan stupa to mark the place where uh, and buddha sent uh, chandaka and then after sending chandaka uh, shrenzang says that on the east of uh, uh, this stupa there is the place where uh, bodhisattva siddhartha cut his hair and then uh, he exchanged uh, clothes with a hunter so i could not explore here i could not locate this chandaka written stupa because i was not allowed to go to this area because because of covid and uh, there were some tensions in india nepal border so i was not allowed to explore here but my guess is that it should be somewhere here so next was to look for these two stupas which was east of this place after sending off uh, both this uh, horse and uh, his uh, charioteer uh, bodhisattva siddhartha moved in the his direction so i was hoping to find this two stupas one of them was ashokan stupa according to shrenzam so i was hoping to find uh, this stupa somewhere in this area you know so when when i reached there i was uh, very uh, i mean like you know uh, i was a little disheartened because it was all forest and whomsoever i met i mean they were like you know all the population because you know until 50 years ago it was all forest so when this uh, barrage was created this uh, little dam was created here so people started settling here so all the settlements are very recent there are only two villages like Dar uh, this uh, darua bari and thari which is like you know people from uh, th these are the tribal people who are who are settled here for last i mean centuries so these were the only people who were ancient otherwise all these people are i mean they are uh, very recent settlers so after meeting few people i met uh, one gentleman and he told me i when i shared with him i am looking for two mounds closely placed and uh, it should be like you know total uh, big structure and uh, uh, so where should i look for it so he said that there are two mounds as i said i mean very closely placed and these are the only two mounds in this whole area and uh, and still they are worshiped by this this people they are tharu people they are tribal people tharu people so they still worship this i mean they are these are still very uh, place of worship so based on this inputs i went to this place so this is like you know this is the village darua bari and this is the first mound is bhavan gadi bhavan gadi and under this is sagar mai so there was according to the people whom i met here they told me that this this two places were connected by some you know uh, ancient route there was there was a connection between these two mounds so it was recently broken he said when this road was being made this road that you see this this white uh, mark uh, line so when this road was being made this road which was connecting this two it got destroyed so otherwise this two and they said that this is very like you know pious place still among the tribal people who live in this district in this whole area so people from neighboring 30 40 km of radius they come and they uh, make sacrificial sacrificial uh, offering here at this place so this is the first mound so shrenzang says uh, a small stupa he saw a small stupa to mark the place where uh bodhisattva siddhartha exchange uh, dress with uh, this hunter so uh, this is a mound and still it is like you know 6 to 7 feet above the neighboring fields and it is circular and uh, it is this diameter is 100 feet and uh, there is a modern temple it was created 25 years ago it's a modern temple and uh, i mean they had dug somewhere so i just took this picture it's a cross section it shows it's full of brick ancient bricks and this is a brick size there this are the bricks this was uh, i mean it's on the surface this bricks are i mean on the surface and when i contacted my friend uh, an uh, archaeologist and uh, asi uh, sri uh, dr sujit nayan so he told me i shared with him the size of the bricks and he said this bricks belong to shung or kushan period i mean like you know it's like very ancient it's from 1 century 1st century bc to 2nd century ad so it's on the surface so if you lit, do little digging if you go 5 6 feet uh, further below so may you may find something like you know even more ancient so this is the first site so according to shrenzang this was a small stupa but still i, I, I just I, as i shared with you that this is still like you know more than 6 to 7 feet from the neighboring fields and it's totally circular if you see from a distance you can make it out like you know it's a stupa structure 
and it's totally brick structure. And this is another mound. So you can see from a distance, it's all, uh, it's in the, uh, like, you know, in the middle of the forest. And this whole area is, a, is like, you know, part of the Tiger Reserve, Valmiki Tiger Reserve. And uh, so I, I could not make a good picture because it's all camouflaged. It's all like, you know, trees everywhere, grass everywhere. So you can see this is like, you know, and this mound is spread in two acres. This is very huge mound, it's spread in two acres. And this is a little close up. And you can see this is a shrine here on the top. This is shrine on the top. This is shrine, modern shrine. But this stupa is very huge. And, and again, it's a total brick structure. I mean, bricks are on the surface. So this is the guy, local Tharu person who helped me in uh, like, you know, uh, taking, he took me to this place. And he shared with me that this place is still very highly revered among the like, you know, local uh, Tharu people. So, and this is again the brick, bricks here. So this brick size, I mean, again, the same bricks of the first mound, the Bhavangari mound. And uh, so these bricks are again from same uh, Shung and Kushan period. And they are on the surface. So if you do some digging, and this is very, I mean, like, and it's still, it's uh, more than 20 to 30 feet from the neighboring uh, fields still. So uh, according to Shwenzang, it was an Ashokan stupa. So it was a big stupa. As I mentioned, it was, it is spread in more than two acres of land. And uh, it's uh, very huge and ancient bricks. And on the top of it, this this shrine is there. You know, I was just I this is elephant shrine, and I'm sharing this picture of uh, Samai Mai shrine in Tilara Kota. That the, I mean, while I was walking, so as I was walking in this Tarai area, I noticed this uh, elephant shrine, uh, this uh, Samai Mai shrine everywhere. After crossing, uh, like you know, uh, from. In the in, in the ancient Kapil Vastu Empire, I think it was very prominent. I mean, in this area, it was uh, it is a very prominent shrine. Wherever I went in villages, I saw this uh, elephant shrine everywhere. So again, at this mound also, this is this elephant shrine is here. Deepak, what is the what is the significance of the elephant shrine? Uh, I, I mean, it's my guess that uh, because this is this shrine is there is also uh, this shrine is also in uh, this uh, Tilara Kota, this uh, palace city, and according to Shrenzang. Uh, uh, he mentions about the uh, the room where Mahamaya gave birth to uh, Bodhisattva. Not birth, but I mean the uh, room where uh, the, the uh, room of uh, Mahamaya. So Shwenzang saw a shrine there. So I have somehow uh, this is just a guess because I mean we know that uh, uh, in the con when this uh, uh, Mahamaya got pregnant with uh, Buddha, so it was like you know elephant tears from the left side. So well, probably, I mean, I see some link between this uh, conception of uh, Mahamaya and this shrine. I, I see some link because, I mean, at Mahamaya, this uh, Samaya Mai temple at Tilarakot, also local people, they come and they offer this elephant uh, thing, this uh, elephant uh, uh, models, like uh, small terracotta things. And you will find it everywhere around this, uh, uh, even in Piprava, I saw this. And uh, at Palta Devi temple also, I noticed this. So it is everywhere in that area around this Lumbini and Piprava and Tilara Kota, this area, everywhere I noticed this, wherever I went. Mm -hmm. So I see some connection between this. But I mean, coming back to this place, like, you know, so this uh, mound, this uh, this is called Sagar Mai here. It's not called Samai Mai, it's called Sagar Mai. But again, it's Mai, it's mother. Mai means mother. So it's again related somewhere to the mother. Mm -hmm. uh, Deepak was just, just for the listeners, Deepak was mentioning about Piprava. That is the Indian side of Kapilavastu. As you know, there are two Kapilavastu. One is in the Nepal and uh, Tilarakot, and another one is in India, which is Piprawa. Okay, and they're actually not too far away. They're actually close to each other. As we know, that Kapilavastu itself was raised to the ground. It was burnt to the ground because it was being attacked by King Virudaka, who took revenge uh, on his uh, Sakyan cousins. All right, so uh, so. Uh, Deepak was saying that you have these elephant shrines even in Kapilavastu, uh, both on the uh, Indian side as well as in the Nepal side. Yeah. So I mean, this this uh, Samai Mai shrine in Tilarakota, when I mean when this Indian archaeologist Banerjee, when he discovered uh, when he discovered this site, he found that uh, this uh, uh, Samai Mai temple at Tilarakota at that time also in 1899. So I mean that is I mean it's a very long tradition, very ancient tradition, which is still uh, like, you know, continuing there. Mm. So I would like to share like, you know, this is a gentleman who who was my local host at Valmiki Nagar, uh, Sri Pramod Singh Ji. So, I mean, he, he was a person who like, you know, he, he knows so much about this place. 
So he took me to these two places and he told me that, I mean, these two mounts are there. So I am thankful to him. So, yeah. So this, uh, this identification is also very important because uh, uh, this is, uh, we know this is, this is like, you know, Bodhisattva Siddhartha, he left Kapilavastu and uh, his uh, destination was Ra Magadha Empire. So he took this route, uh, to, he took this track from, uh, he, he went through Vaishali. So we know that the, there are Ashokan pillars at Vaishali, Ariraj, uh, Lauria Nandan Gurd. So all this site, this was an ancient trade route. And, uh, and there's an Ashokan pillar here at Lumbini. And this was also track taken by Mahapajapati Gautmi when he see one, see went to Vaishali for this, like, you know, with 500 Shakyan women. So this discovery, which is here, I mean, so according to Shwenzang, this is the place where Buddha cut his hair. So this is a very good, uh, I mean, like, you know, so this identification, uh, of course, I mean, it's a very preliminary stage, but still, I mean, uh, this will help us in completing this uh, Mahabash, uh, this great renunciation trail, uh, which starts from Kapilavastu, Ramagrama and Anupia, uh, uh, which was in Malla kingdom. And from here, then again, we have uh, Shokan pillar starts from here. So this would be a very, like, you know, uh, a future for future, this could be a very great uh, pilgrimage trail walking or I mean something, anything. So this can be a very interesting uh, trail for pilgrimage and tourism. So again, uh, gratitude to Shrenzang. It is because of him that we know uh, we could discover, we could, uh, we could, I mean, like, you know, uh, look for it. Uh, go we, we could go searching for this place based on Shrenzang accounts only. So his contribution is so immense, so important. Uh, without him, we, we could have never known where all this thing happened. So this is basically, if anybody has any questions. Uh... Uh, sir. Hello. Yeah. Uh, yes. Is that is that a question coming in? Yes. Yes, yes. Sir, the difference uh, between uh, Kapil Vastu and uh, Nova River is yeah. mentioned as 30 yojan. Yeah, 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 that's true. I mean, in different texts, it's different things. Somewhere it's like a two yojan. In some texts, it's like, you know, 10 yojan. In some no, no, sir, 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 this is mentioned in Jatak Atkatha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know that. I mean, you can read the book. I mentioned that. You can go to my blog and I have mentioned all this story. I mean, what says what, which literature says which. I mean, I've already put that there are three or four. All this literature, which I've just mentioned, like, you know, yes, this, Yes, all this literature they have different versions. Like you know, sir, you... in the in in this uh, book, sir, only mentioned Anuman Nadi Tire, but yeah. in the Tripitak, nowhere it is mentioned the place. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, Even all... at the time of cutting of the hairs, mothers and fathers were weeping. I mean, different literatures have mentioned. Sir, it is mentioned in the Arya Pariyasena Sutta of the Tripitak. Yeah. How yeah. can you say that uh, uh, Buddha cut his hairs uh, at the river uh, Anuma, sir? I have mentioned, I have told you, you know, this, this is the description of the, all the details, what literature, like, you know, this, uh, Shrenzang says about uh, the place where he landed, where he sent back Chandaka, from there, uh, towards the east was the place where he cut his hair. So yes, sir, not... yes, sir. But that is only ancient book, that is Jataka Katha, sir. But before Jatak Atkatha, it is not mentioned, sir. I mean, there are different biographical texts. I mean, I'm not disputing all those things. I'm just following the Shrenzang. I mean, okay, different, okay. Thank you, sir. different things. I'm, I'm not disputing that. But I mean, that is why I have put all these versions, you know, what, uh, which literature says what. I've just put, I've collected all those things, information. I've just put it in, you know, this table. So you can, I mean, based on all this input, because all of them not are not covering the entire episode. I mean, all of them don't say everything. I mean, they are just skipping something, some details. They are putting something, uh, some other details. So I'm just trying to collect all those things and put and uh, try to put and uh, try to weave a story around what Shenzang has said. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, so um, so uh, Deepak, you have actually done this journey, uh, uh, 750 kilometers, which I think right now much more <laughs> that you have traveled. Can you please tell us, you know, how easy or how difficult is it to uh, to move around in order to uncover these places, you know, of following the Sunshine Trail? Uh, because you are just 
wondering, just with a haversack, traveling very light, and uh, how is the journey? Especially now when there is this COVID-19, how do you manage to do all this? COVID was uh, not in a big issue because you know in India still there's a tradition if there's somebody who's doing pilgrimage, so people in villages, even in cities, they are very welcoming. I uh, During my whole pilgrimage, I always stayed in temples. So most of the time I stayed in temples. So, and everywhere, nobody discriminated anything, you know, because I was taking all the precautions. So, and they offered food and they even said they couldn't can stay for even more days. So, uh, I mean, I didn't see, face any, like, you know, I was uh, anticipating that because of COVID, I can, I would face some discrimination, but I didn't face any discrimination at any place. Uh, as far as difficulty is concerned, uh, I mean, it was not at all difficult because, I mean, if you, if you read Shrenzang accounts and as I was walking, I could imagine how difficult it would have been at that time because it, at that time there were no roads. It was all dense forest, especially if you see the Shrenzang thing, you know, from, uh, uh, if you see Shrenzang's uh, travel from uh, Sankisa to Shavast from Shavasti, everything was like, you know, in a very bad shape. When he reached Shavasti, there were very few people there. At uh, Kapilavastu, I mean, it was in very bad shape. He says there were more than 1,000 monasteries in ruins. There were nobody at Kapilavastu, I mean, for Palace City, there was only small monastery. There, there were a handful of people who guided him to neighboring place. And it was such a desolate thing that, uh, uh, like, you know, uh, yeah, so uh, Shrenzang was at Tilarakota and Piprava is just here. Piprava was a very important place. This was the place where uh, Shakyan people, they deposit the body relics of the Buddha. Yet, uh, Shrenzang was not told about it. And, and archaeological evidence suggests in the second century AD, this monastery was abandoned. So this place was totally abandoned and it went out of tradition. So this place was such a wild and I mean, it was so engulfed by the forest that uh, all these important places were out of tradition. Nobody knew about this. The people who were at Tilarakota, Lumini, who guided Shrenzang and Fashin, they didn't mention about Piprava, though it was such an important place. It was a, uh, the Kapilavastu monastery. The, the central monastery of the Kapilavastu empire was here and it was situated around this uh, relic stupa, which was made by Ashoka. And I mean, before that, Shakin's people built that stupa. It is, it is established in excavation. We have found inscriptions also saying that this is a Kapilavastu monastery. So yet, I mean, they could not. So the idea is that this whole trail was, I mean, at Ramagrama also, there was only few people who were taking care of the shrine. And again, I mean, Shrenzang and Fashian, both of them, they warned that, I mean, this is very, this whole track is in the forest and it's very wild. You have to be very careful with, I mean, wild animals. They always, they mention all these things. And they have not mentioned this anywhere else. What they, uh, all this uh, warnings which they say, uh, they mention, it's only from Shavasti to like, you know, Kushinagar. Even Kushinagar was totally abandoned. There was nobody. I mean, he doesn't talk about any monastic community there at uh, Kushinagar. So while I was walking, I was reminded about all those things. I knew that uh, this was one of the uh, difficult, most difficult trek both of these monks uh, who took. And we should be grateful to them. I mean, I'm sure they must be, they, were, they must have been warned somewhere that you should not go further this side because this is not a safe place. Yet because they were devout Buddhist. And Shrenzang had a very uh, a larger picture in his mind for Buddhist pilgrimage. I mean, he, he knew he has to go back and he has to promote Buddhism. So he didn't want to skip anything. So he risked his life and he traveled to all these places, which was like, you know, dense forest. So while I was uh, walking, I was not allowed to go to Nepal, but I mean, I still uh, walked along the border. So uh, I, uh, I noticed one thing that uh, wherever I stayed in the evening, people would share with me the stories of tiger and leopard. Like, you know, till very recently, tigers and leopards would enter in their villages and they would uh, take away goats and, uh, you know, uh, uh, animals. So it was still very prevalent. So I mean, you can just imagine at the time of Shenzhen how dangerous this trek uh, would be like. You know, I mean, this is uh, for our our own imagination. So I was I was knowing all those things. So when I was staying uh, at the villages, I would uh, share all the stories about Buddha and Shenzhen, and I told them that this is the oh. the most important trek. Like you know, because this was a trek which was taken by Buddha, and after that, Mahapajapati got me also. So this this has a very immense future pilgrimage potential. Many people would love to walk and take this trail uh, following the footsteps of the Buddha and uh, Mahapajapati Gautami. So yes, I didn't face any, I mean, I, I, I was not at all concerned about the difficulties. I mean, in modern times, sir, I mean, there's a very good road and you have all modern gadgets. So you don't have to think about all those things. And Shrenzang is such a big inspiration. If you read his travel accounts, so you don't uh, see anywhere, you know, even difficulties, the 
he sees he just uh, mentioned it as it is he doesn't say it's like it is bad or good he just says i mean a few people died i mean few of his people died while crossing this uh, mountain range so i mean he doesn't say that oh it's very bad somebody died and this this is it this many people died i mean it, he just sees things as it is it's just happening so he was very mindful and he was not judgmental like you know he was just uh, he knew that all this thing happens when when you are making travel So this Gandak River itself is a very important river. Just looking at the map that you have, it looks yeah. at the, all the important cities, right? Uh, there is one map that you had, which shows, you know, the cities, the trade route along the Gandak River, right? All the way. So after the Buddha cut his hair, he yeah. has actually traveled along this, uh, where the Gandak River is traveling, because that is actually the trade route, yes. Um, going all the way to Magadha, uh, yeah. Because current day, uh, this is what we call Bihar. Bihar yeah. is actually a short form for Vihara, right? Yeah. So there were yeah. there were a lot of uh, religious practitioners. So after the Bodhisattva has uh, renounced, he had to go to the place where there are practitioners. And uh, yeah. you know, he went from teacher to teacher, and you know that he studied under two very famous teachers, Alara Kalama and uh, uh, Udaka Ramaputta. And after not being able to find enlightenment under the teachers, he decided to go on his own to Dungashiri, which is close to uh, Budgaya. And uh, then uh, we know that later on, six years of, of going doing uh, ascetic practices, he decided to adopt the middle path. And uh, he also crossed a river, the Naranjaya River, to the other side and sat under the Bodhi tree that we call that right now as, uh, you know, where them. Mahabodhi uh, tree, Mahabodhi temple is actually actually situated. So this is actually a very important river. It's called Ganda, River Ganda, right? Ganda River. So right. it is uh, all the trade routes. Is, they're just falling along along the, the river. So actually this map gives him a completely different understanding because if we go by road, we actually go to Nepal this way. But from this map, I could actually see this following the Ganda River. And it actually makes a, a lot of sense. Uh, and uh, this river is also for transportation, for water, things like that. And there are Ashokan pillars here, like you know, to, to mark this route. I mean, they have uh, yeah. there are Ashokan pillars here. At Vaishali, there's an Ashokan pillar. Mm. This Arjas, Nandangar, Lumbini, and I mean, we know that this was the I mean, like you know, uh, Rama Grama uh, Buddha came, and uh, from here, I mean, Nandangar also Ashokan Stupa is here. So, uh, Ashokan pillar is here. So, this is I mean, and this is following the Gandak River. I mean, this is moving yeah. along the Gandak River. Yes. And I, initially, I had some apprehension because I was told that Gandak River at this place has got lots of crocodile. But when I went there and I inquired local people, they said there are crocodile. But still, I mean, it's people are I mean traveling through this. I mean, so crocodile is not a big threat. Earlier, I thought that I mean maybe uh, Shenzang didn't cross uh, uh, here. I thought he must have gone from here somewhere here. This this he he, he could have taken that route. But uh, when I reached here, when I did some inquiry, he told no. I mean, this is the favorite place. I mean, this is a prevalent place where people used to cross Gandak since a uh, long time. So then I got confidence. Otherwise, I was also hoping that, I mean, I was also wanting to explore this uh, trail, you know, this track, because there are two Ashokan pillars here. Oh. But, uh, uh, now, I mean, when I went to this place, and when I saw these two Ashokan, these this two big mounds in the middle of the forest, and there are no other mounds, and as Shenzang said, exactly they are placed like that. So, I mean, I there was no doubt, you know, the bricks, and they are all stupa shaped. I mean, they are all round and I mean, like in a sphere, uh, spherical shape. And as Shenzang says, one of them was a small stupa. He says, I mean, he, he uses this word small stupa. And another stupa is a shukan stupa. So, yes. So, it would be good if, you know, the Indian archaeology, uh, you know, would do some kind of uh, work here. Yeah, in order exactly. to you know ascertain that this is indeed a place, uh, just yeah. looking at the bricks that is being used, you know, uh, this this will have a uh, very uh, you know religious significance for the Buddhists, and this yeah. will completely open up the uh, the scope for Buddhist pilgrimage actually. Yeah. And we have we have also to locate this third stupa, the first stupa, which should be at the bank of um, I was just talking, you know, that first yeah. stupa should be somewhere here. It should be somewhere here, you know, it's a very big area. So next time when I go, because I could not finish this Nepal part, I was not allowed to enter Nepal. So when I go to Nepal part, I would try to, I would want, uh, like to explore this area because this area is Nepal, Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, all three, I mean, like, you know, 
so this is a big area it's like you know 10 15 kilometers area so and there are many villages here uh-huh. so i hope to find somewhere here because it was east of this so it should be somewhere anywhere anywhere in this area you know so this is also forest so i could not do much exploration because i was not allowed to go and enter these places but uh, east of this these two mounds i mean ashwanzang says uh, it was found so i i i am sure i uh, some exploration would lead us to find this first stupa also yes once if you find the third, uh, the third stupa then yeah. indeed uh, the, you, know, you can almost like confirm that based yeah. on such records that these are the places that such and described uh, yeah. what was the villagers reaction when they found that these stupas are connected with the buddha do they know very much about the buddha i told this story but they were not i mean like you know very uh, because m- m- many people they do not they are not aware about buddha also like you know yeah. i mean Uh, but when i shared this with uh, pramod singh ji when i uh, he was my host when i shared with him he was he knew about buddha and also he was also surprised because uh, this was totally unexpected but what uh, what i find interesting is these two mounds there are like you know they say there are 52 gars this is called bavan gadi gar means anything which has got brick structure gar means anything mound or i'm like you know anything which is made of bricks ancient bricks so this bavan gadi there are like you know they say there are 52 gadis in this whole area i mean this valmiki nagar area which is worshiped by uh, this tharu people but they say this is the center like is this is the main this two uh-huh. and rest of the mounds they are like on the hill top and somewhere these are the only two mounds in this whole area they say that there is no other mound in the like you know from this area this area there is no other mound so this also further confirms and this is under continuous the, the people they are worshiping it i mean still this tribal people who are like you know the most ancient uh, settlers here they they are living here for past many centuries so this i see some ancient connection this uh, worshiping thing is coming down the line i mean when buddhist left so maybe when these people uh, arrived there so they found some connection so this worshiping part is like you know this uh, uh, the sanctity is continued yes. this is what i am did you say that the people were taru Taro yeah, people, Taro. Uh, yeah, because there, there are also Taro people in uh, Nepal, and yeah, they are yeah. also Buddhists actually. Yeah, Some yeah. of them. These Taros, they have come from Nepal. I mean, they have all come uh, from the Hindu area. Okay, okay, all right. Now I just like to know, uh, Bobby, uh, are there questions coming in? Yeah. So. uh i would like to request all the listeners please uh, let us uh, please join us in making shrenzang popular famous people should know that uh, immense contribution of shrenzang because generally we are being taught that shrenzang was a uh, uh, visitor who came to india he was not an ordinary person he was an extraordinary person his contribution is so immense in understanding the buddhist pilgrimage and this whole work of this uh, retracing bodhi sattva shrenzang is to create awareness about uh, the works of shrenzang his contribution so please join us in this effort of uh, making shrenzang a like you know real i mean his we should be we should acknowledge his contribution in proper way and this is our uh, website if somebody if he wants to contribute i mean he can jo- he can visit our this site and uh, please help us join us mm. yes um maybe while the others are thinking about uh, the questions to ask yeah, yeah. i think they are probably like overwhelmed by the presentation uh what was it that actually set you on this path of trying to discover the trails a uh, swanchang trail what was it that actually inspired you why do you want to uh, uh, move on this way i've been working on shrenzang for like you know past 12 years now when i was in uh, nalanda i got in contact with nam nalanda mahavir dr pant so he really inspired me to read shrenzang text i was an engineer so it was all new to me so when i read shrenzang book i found it a very i mean like you know jigsaw puzzle so i i found it very interesting to like you know uh, get engaged into it and to see objectively how because then i also came to know that many places have not been identified and there are multiple identification of many places so i just wanted to explore and just uncover this whole puzzle so when i read this book i read this book multiple times and based on because i have been engineering so i what i did was uh, based on book i created excel files and objectively you know uh, put the whole book on excel sheets and then i prepared map so at that time i was doing everything in fun but then i realized that this is a very interesting task because uh, we have all the modern because britishers had this difficulty they didn't had maps 
They didn't have this Google Earth. They didn't have all these GIS tools. So then I somehow I learned the, there's another gentleman, Sanjay Mathurji. So he got, he gave me all the GIS uh, software and everything. He taught me how to study maps and everything. So based on that, then I started plotting and then I, it became very interesting as I started going to places because wherever you, I mean, Shrenzan says, and if you go to that place, you will find those things. I mean, this is so interesting. Villages settle on the mounds, caves, rock shelters, as Shrenzan described. So after a point, I thought that why not, uh, because then if you go to places, if you go to Shravasti, like, you know, if, uh, so only Jetavana is the place which where people go. But Jetwana is surrounded by many other smaller shrines, which Shrenzang says that those shrines, many of those shrines are protected monument by ASI, but nobody goes there. So people should know that this, the pilgrimage that we are currently taking is a very small pilgrimage. Shrenzang talks about a very elaborate pilgrimage. So for the pilgrimage that we are doing currently is a small pilgrimage, which was revived by Britishers. I mean, it was 150 years ago, 100 years ago. So now we should think about uh, reviving the complete pilgrimage mentioned by Shrenzang. I mean, we can do it. I mean, it's not a difficult task now. Which has faced such a big difficulty in spite of, you know, the story of Nalanda. Uh, they were so inspired by Shrenzang accounts that uh, in 1914, when First World War was going on, still the money came from Asiatic Society of uh, Great Britain to start excavation of Nalanda. So they were very passionate people and they did all those, what the present pilgrimage is totally done by, most of the work is done by Britishers. I mean, British uh, explorers at that time, Archaeological Survey of India of that times. So now we have sufficient uh, resources and manpower and people like, you know, now, I mean, Malaysia is also here and Japan, Korea, everybody like, you know, Singapore, Taiwan, Thailand, Burma. So all of us can come together and revive the whole pilgrimage because they are not, although Buddha walked in whole Gangetic plain, but then Shrenzan talks about only 22, 20, 30 places where Buddha walked. So instead of eight, we should go to 30. There are only 30 places. They are not millions, only 30 places which we have to like, you know, bring to the pilgrimage uh, thing. So uh, this was one idea to create awareness. Second thing was like, you know, all these ancient things are in the villages. And like, you know, if you go to Purvarama, which is in uh, uh, Shravasti, there's a village Khandabari settled on the, this mound. So there's a monk who is uh, trying to create awareness. And I've, I, I spent time with these villages. So all the elder people, they are totally ignorant about the significance of the place. But I mean, the, the young generation, there was a girl called Priyanka. I mean, all of this new generation are interested now. So we have to tap all this potential and we have to use, we have to come together and revive the complete pilgrimage of friends. And this is why I'm thinking of uh, making a good documentary film and like, you know, in all languages, so that if people start going to these places, these people will, these places will be revived. These local people will start valuing their heritage. Mm -hmm. so this interaction is also important. So one objective of this walk was this uh, Shrenzang retracing Bodhisattva Shrenzang is to create awareness among the local people. So that is why I'm writing all the blogs, what I'm, uh, what local people think, how to, I mean, what is there. So local people are not, uh, I mean, th 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 when they listen to all these stories, they are equally overwhelmed and, and they feel that, oh, I mean, uh, such a great place it is. So this is the idea, like, you know, to take this pilgrimage from eight great places to elaborate with this pilgrimage, what Shrenzang says. Even if you go to Kapilavas to Tilarakota, there are many small little known places around there. But I mean, people are not interested. People generally, because they're not aware. Similarly, if you go to Sarnath, there's a site called Lat Bhaira, which Shrenzang talks about Ashokan Pillar. So the site is very much there and it's very close to uh, this uh, Rishi Pattana site, the main Ashokan Pillar site. So uh, even in Bodh Gaya, people just uh, limit themselves to the Mahabodhi temple. They don't go to Brahmayuni. Many people, they don't go to Sujata place, the place where Buddha took austerities. So the idea is to create awareness about the elaborate Buddhist pilgrimage which Shrenzang talks about. Okay. Now, I think there are uh, some things that uh, that uh, Deepak has mentioned, just for the sake of our audience who have not uh, gone over to India. One was, uh, uh, Deepak was mentioning about Pubarama, right, uh, Deepak? Yeah, uh, yeah. The, Pubarama was a gift by uh, of uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh because she was a major sponsor, a lay major sponsor of the Buddha. And uh, You see, once the Buddha reached about the age of, of 55, he wanted to have an ideal place where the, in order to spend the rainy seasons. And you know that in India, there are actually three seasons. One of the seasons is the rainy season. Now, he was actually invited over to, uh, uh, to uh, the Shravasti by Anata Pindika. 
And the Buddha spent 24 rainy seasons, you know, uh, retreat, 24 rich years, 24 years at uh, the uh, Shravasti. But out of that, 19 was spent in uh, Jitabhana Grove, and about five was in Pubarama, yeah. which was also in the, uh, in the Shravasti, but being offered by Vishaka. So, the, so uh, what Deepak was saying is not this Pubarama, there is a village on top of it because people didn't know the, the significance of it. Of course, when we go for pilgrimage, we go over to Jetavana Grove, it is still there. But we didn't know that there is another place where the monks and the Buddhas spent five rain, rainy seasons there. And that's called Pubarama, all right? So this is how the concept of our pilgrimage could actually be opened up when we discover new things. And there is another thing, uh, if you could go back to your picture of the Ramagram, the Ramagrama, when you had a picture, you shut some screen just now. Can mm -hmm. you have that picture? Let me just explain to people who might not know about the significance of this place. Yeah, one minute. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, this is called a Rama Grama. In fact, during my first two pilgrimages, I did a pilgrimage when I was about the age of 25. <laughs> a backpacker with, with uh, four other friends, and we followed some kind of itinerary, but we never came to this place. And another time, we went, I went for pilgrimage in 1992, and we, didn't, we were not brought to Ramagrama, but actually this Ramagrama is really significant. This Ramagrama stupa is in the land of the Koliyas, and the Koliyas is from the Buddha's mother's side, okay? Mahamaya uh, and uh, Prajapati Gautami. They are the Koliyas. And you see, after the Buddha passed away, where after the body was cremated, the remains of the Buddha was actually uh, put into eight portions. And one portion, one eighth of the portion, was given to the Koliyas. And then they, 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 they built this stupa called Rama Grama. Okay? So these stupa enshrined one eighth of the Buddha's remains. Now, I'm, when Ampura Ashoka became a Buddhist, uh, about 200, 200 years, 250 years after the Buddha, after he was converted into, into Buddhism, he decided to build stupas all over his kingdom. And in order to get relics, he had to get the relics from seven of the stupas. So he opened up the stupas, took out the relics, leave a little bit behind, and use the relics in order to uh, implant these relics in all the stupas that he has built. But when he came over to this Ramagrama stupa, because the land of the Koliyas was not under Ashoka's, uh, uh, it was not under, under his territory, you know, it's not under his empire. The people here, um, uh, you can call them Nagas, they say that please, uh, Emperor, please do not uh, remove any of the relics here. And uh, so it is actually believed that one eighth of the relics are still intact in this stupa. Yeah. In fact, according to Xuanzang, that, that sometimes light would emanate from the stupa at night, and even elephants will come and sprinkle water over the stupa. So if you no. come over for a pilgrimage, the next time when you go to Lumpini, please come and visit Ramagrama and do some meditation down there. Now Ramagrama becomes more well-known. In fact, this whole place has been, has been done up very nicely. And this is what Deepak is saying. When yeah. people begin to discover about the place, then they begin to look after it, and the local people begin to have a sense of appreciation for, you know, for that they have a heritage place. And this is called the Rama Grama Stupa. Yeah, and the, I mean, Shrenzan talks about a very interesting story that cobra snakes, they take care of it, like, you know, it protects it. Yes. The cobra snakes, I mean, all those stories. But I mean, Shrenzan talks about this place that uh, it is being taken care of by cobra snakes, Naga. Oh, yes, cobras and snakes. <laughs> <laughs> So actually, at that time, it was quite quite dangerous to remove anything from here, and it remains there. There is one question, uh, uh, Deepak, and yeah. this comes from the World Fellowship of Buddhist Youth uh, Facebook page. Uh, this is from uh, Brahmanda Pratap Barua Ripon. The question, why don't you make a pilgrimage brochure where people can find all the information? Yeah, I mean, uh, we are in the process of that. That's what the, uh, I was talking to you, Dr. B, yesterday. I mean, we should come out with, I mean, like, you know, 
as you mentioned that you would be talking to IBC and all uh, your friends and all. So we can come together, we can make a very comprehensive uh, documentary film and brochures and uh, publications and website mm -hmm. so that people can see all the maps and all the places, significance, how do we know those places are correct places and I mean, all the story, because one of the objectives of this walk is also to tell the story behind the things, you know, how do we know that these places are correct places? Mm. Because there are, all the places have got multiple identifications. Yes. So, and many of these identifications are multiple and people are still continuing with it because uh, the names of Britishers are involved with that. So they don't want to challenge it. Yeah. But they don't understand that these places were identified 150 years ago when there were no proper maps. And most of the times, this explorer, they didn't themselves go there. I mean, they just collected information from there. I mean, like, you know, subordinates who would go uh, to, like, you know, if you see this map, yeah. if you see this map of, uh, yeah, so this is, you know, this is the Cunningham route. I mean, so wherever he went, he found some mound. He said, this is this. So Shenzhen says next this. So when he goes, he finds some another village with some mounds. He said, this is this. So, I mean, this is this is the trail like this. Wherever he went, he found, and there are some stories like, you know, he went to some village, this Carlyle went to one village, and he said this, this village is Kapilavastu, and this water tank, it is called something related with elephant. So later on, some explorer went to just recheck what Carlyle has said. So when they went to that village, and they inquired the local people, where is this particular uh, water tank, which Carlyle has mentioned, with the name of elephant. He said, this is not called the elephant tank. Uh, Kalil came and he himself named this tank as elephant tank. Huh. You know? So, I mean, this is, if you read this text, it's all there. So this, all this identification are totally under, we should re-examine all this text. I mean, so uh, the idea is when we come out with this text, this book, so we should also talk about why this identification is correct, why this identification is wrong, because at many places, we have not found any inscription like Veluvana. No inscription has been found. And Vulture's Peak, no inscription has been found. But we are sure that these are the places because circumstantial evidence are so strong, like Jethi and Yastivana, no inscription has been found. Prague Bodhi Hill, no inscription has been found. If you go to uh, even Sankasya, no inscription has been found, no excavation has happened there yet. So, but the circumstantial evidence are so strong, everything is like, you know, so compelling. So we, on the basis of that, we said that these are the correct identification. But this identification, like, you know, if we didn't find all these Ashokan pillars here, so we would have still continued with all this identification made by Cunningham and Caroline. But we are fortunate that 25 years after this identification, in the jungle, I mean, it was very difficult to find this. Uh, there are so many stories, interesting stories, how these three pillars were discovered. So if we, for some reason, if we could not uh, discover this, we were not able to discover this Ashokan pillars. So we would have continued still with all these things, all these places, we would have continued. So we are fortunate that we found this. So that's why we know that this Ramagrama is wrong and Ramagrama here is correct. So the Chandaka Stupa, which was identified by Carlyle and Cunningham here, it is not here, it should be somewhere here. So we should come out. That is why I've shared this story of why do we say that this is the correct place. And I mean, another thing is when Shwenzang says, so there's very little question of like, you know, doubt. I mean, when I went to this place, even before that, uh, when I plotted this, I was expecting that I should find this stupa somewhere here. I mean, this is just, a, I was, I prepared all these maps one year, two years before this walk. You know, I was working on this, okay, I will take the walk this someday, so I should look for here and there. And you go there and you found there, find that. It's a, such a, it's not a coincidence, I mean, it's this great, I mean, coincidence that Shwenzang says, and it's, a, you, and they are all ancient mounds. The bricks are very ancient. Yeah, I, think, I think that's very interesting. I think what I learned, uh, Deepak, is that sometimes when we hear the name of Cunningham, it's almost like, wow, you know, these are, these, these are the, you know, uh, the famous uh, archaeologists, only to find out that even archaeologists sometimes can actually make a mistake. And once they go on to the mistake, they try to get evidence when there is no real evidence. And as part of the scientific uh, discipline, we, if there is a better, you know, evidence, we will have to discard the what we have and to shift on, shift track. And exactly. it is a good thing that uh, that the Ashoka pillars was actually discovered and enables us to shift track. And because of that, now you can find the two mounts. Now there are some questions that have just come in, uh, Deepak. Uh, let me see. Uh, okay, now there is uh, three questions here. One is by Victoria Go, 
And he says, uh, Mr. Deepak, in the long discourse 27, the Buddha delivered an important sutra at the Megara Mother Mansion in Shabate. Uh, the Indian Archaeological Society, as I un understand, was unable to identify the mansion. Whether you managed to identify the Megara Mother Mansion, that is number one. Eh? The mother, Megara Mother Mansion at Shabate, and I wish Indian Archaeological Society says they could not you cannot find it, whether you can. Number two, we have uh, from, uh, uh, do you want me to go through the three questions or one by one? Yeah, this question, I mean, this first question, okay. uh, the link, uh, the, the, uh, this place is Purvarama. This uh, this event took place in Purvarama. So this place has been, I mean, we do not, uh, this village which we're talking about, it is settled on that mound. Right. So the place is actually called uh, Purvarama. The, the, Purvarama. This, yeah. So, I mean, I had mentioned about this in my story on Purvarama. You can find on that my blog. So right. we, can say, we can send him the link of that story because I was Purvarama, I have mentioned all those things that he has mentioned, it's there. Okay. So yeah. so this uh, Megara mother's mansion is actually Purvarama. Purvarama, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Megara's mother, because sometimes the mother's name is yeah. being called by the Ch child's name. <laughs> yeah. uh, the son, the, the mother of the mother of so-and-so, okay? Yeah. So that is actually Purvarama, uh, um, which uh, Deepak mentioned, okay? So actually, uh, if you go to uh, the Shravasti, uh, uh, yeah, Shravasti, this is where Pubarama is there, but we are not giving a lot of significance to that. There's another one from Bikram uh, Pandek, and uh, he says, Deepak Ji, the red bullet you have shown in the map above the name uh, Chandaka Kantaka appears to be in the Nepal Indian border. Gandaki River Junction, known as Tribeni. What do you think, Deepakji? Uh, sir, I cannot say anything on this unless until I do some exploration here because it's. Uh, I told you, uh, it should be somewhere here. I mean, it should be somewhere here uh, because this is all forest, and at that time it was even dense forest. And this is the only small open uh, window which opens here. Otherwise, here also further south there's a hill. I mean, there's a small like you know um, hillock which is uh, like you know not uh, uh, good for. Uh, transportation, I mean, for travel. So this is the only small window. So my hope is, my guess is that it should be somewhere in this area, the Chandaka Stupa. Triveni is further up. I mean, it's like, you know, further on the hills. So I don't think it is on the hill because the horse landed on the sand. I mean, it says, Pali literature says it landed on the sand. So it is on the sand. So sand is only here. I mean, this is the place where this is the area where there was sand and river was flowing here, like, you know, it was going from here. So it can be anywhere here. I mean, it will take another one or two months when this lockdown is over and I go there, I can, we can explore and we can see where it is. Mm, okay. And there is a question from Victoria Go again. Mr. Deepak, as I understand, there is a scandal with regards to the site of Kapilavastu in India. Uh, this is in regards to Dr. Furious identification of Indian Kapilavastu, because in the view of Dr. Charles Allen's research and UNESCO's research, what is your take of Mr. Charles Allen's finding that the Indian Kapilavastu is not the hometown of the Buddha? Let me let me explain. I mean, Kapilavastu was an empire. It was a kingdom. It was not a. It was a capital. It was an uh, empire, and there was a capital. So the Indian Kapilavastu Piprava is not the, according to me, what I think it is not a city. It is not a capital city. It was the monastery of Kapilavastu. The inscription says it is the monastery of Kapilavastu. And Shakyan people, because it was part of the Kapilavastu empire, so the palace city is Tilarakuta. That is correct. I mean, what Charles Allen say, I totally agree with him. I've also put a story on my blog on this, that Kapilavastu, the present identification, Tilarakuta, I think it is the correct identification. It is the palace city. And the Piprava is also Kapilavastu, but it is part of the Kapilavastu empire. It is not Kapilavastu city. City is Tilarakota, but this is the Piprava was the monastery of Shakyan people, the important monastery, the central monastery which they funded. And this is where they enshrined the relics. So I have put a story on this. I mean, there are two or three stories which I mentioned. I, I have also spoken about we should connect these two places, Piprava and Tilarakota, because if people from royal people, they came and they enshrined the relics at Piprava. So there must be some connection. This Piprava should be an important place at that time. That's why they choose that place to enshrine the Buddha relics there. That is why they choose to establish a monastery there, Kapilavastu Monastery. So we should connect these two places and there should be no dispute of like, you know, Indian Kapilavastu and Nepalese Kapilavastu. Kapilavastu was empire. Uh, 
Yeah. Supposedly, I mean, like, you know, if there's some country and they divide into two parts, like South Korea, North Korea, but it is Korea. Mm. It's just like, you know, so this, uh, at that time, it was not like, you know, India or Nepal. So it was a couple of us two empire. So it, now this present border has just divided this two, uh, couple of us two into two halves. Yes, I think sometimes there can be a misunderstanding. Actually, yeah. because of the border, uh, you know, the entry point, after Tilara Accord, in order to get to Piprawa, you've got to go a long way, pass through the, uh, the DCIQ, the Customs, Immigration and all that, and travel along this road uh, to Piprawa. It makes you think that the Tilara Accord and Piprawa are really far away, but actually it is not. It is if the border is actually opened, you can actually just cross over. You must remember that the uh, city of Kapilavastu was actually raised to the ground. It was burned to the ground and the Sakins were killed. Right, yeah. and that was during the time when the Buddha was alive. So the whole Kapilavastu, as a walled city surrounded by moat and all that, was completely burnt to the ground. And the Buddha's relics, after the city had been burnt to the ground, the Buddha's relics was put at uh, at uh, Piprawa, which is also part of of uh, part of the kingdom, right? So uh, and that that is at the monastery, that is on the Indian side. So actually, that should not have been really a big problem. Uh, Unless you say that Piprawa is where the prince grew up, and then that could be an issue. Yeah. Yeah. So, Dr. V, so this is the Tilara Kota and this is Piprawa. So you can see, uh, like, you know, so this is just like, you know, just 17 kilometers from here. Lumbini, yeah. This is the Indian Nepal border. So I walked along this border. And uh, Shrenzang says there are thousand monasteries of Kapilavastu which were like in uh, ruins. I encountered many remains ancient remains along this trail, you know, mounds, which anybody could guess that they are like, you know, some ancient remains. So this area has got lots of ancient remains, this Indian side. So they were all like, you know, monasteries, which uh, Shrenzang says, like thousands, he says thousands of, more than thousand monasteries of Kapilavastu, they are in ruins, they are in bad shape. So all these monasteries, they are on both sides. So I saw many monastic remains. I mean, I, they were remains. I, I don't claim they were monastic remains, but they could be monastic remains because they were all ancient remains. I, I walked along this trail from coming from uh, Shravasti. So uh, so this is Kapil was on the both side. It's, it's on the both side. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is the kingdom of the Sakyas. But yeah, this Sakya. is divided into Nepal and India, but this was on kingdom. Yeah. There's a question debunked by uh, Mary Aubrey. And she says, uh, Deepak, will you point out on the map with Kapilavastu and Vishali where the mounds you find are so that he, she can get the bearings uh, uh, based on where you have been? So this is the place where the two mounds have been discovered. This is this a place. Mm. So this is Ramagrama. So uh, uh, this is the place I think that where, according to Shrenzang, uh, uh, Shrenzang took this route, he crossed, uh, he traveled from Ramagrama to hair cutting stupa, he traveled east. Yes. So this is east, this is the best possible place which I, I could guess. Yes. And uh, I found these two stupas here. So this is the ancient Anupia because I mean this was, this happened in Anupia according to other literatures. Mm, Anupia. Anupia. Anupia is part of Ma Malas. Mm. So For the again, Malas. Oh, yeah, Malas. They were yeah. also supporters of the Buddha, the Malas. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. From here, Shrenzang goes, Fashian and Shrenzang goes to the stupa where charcoal stupa was there, you know, where this Moriyas or people even. So I travel further this side and I've located that village also, but I'm not very sure about it. So I'm not talking about that village in this uh, talk. So that village somewhere here. I have already put that story on the blog. So from here, Shrenzang come to, came to here. And so this is the route, which was, this was the ancient route. I mean, this was the ancient route, which I, I think this was the ancient route taken by Bodhisattva Siddhartha and after uh, him, Mahapajapati Gotmi also took the same route, following mm. that. Mm. Yeah. And of course, Veshali at that time was a very important trade route, trading yeah. route. City of Veshali. Yeah, and this Ashokan Stupa, they are to mark some important journey. Mm. Mark the footsteps of the Buddha. They are all Dhamma pillars. Yes. So they are all falling in the line. I mean, you can see this is the curve. Yes. Rama Grama is here. So, I mean, we have to just connect this two dot, Rama Grama and Nandangar. We have to connect this two dot. Hmm. This falls exactly in the between. Hmm. So, uh, we know from other literature that Bodhisattva Siddhartha crossed Rama Grama. Hmm. And this is Ashokan pillar. So, this is our best possible guess that this was the ancient trade route. So, yeah. if we connect this two dot, it goes through this. So, this is the Nupia. I mean, it is also corroborated from that ways also. Okay. 
So there is a feedback from Bikram uh, Pandey, and he says that uh, thank you, Deepak Ji. Uh, I'm happy with your explanation. That he was the first uh, first one who asked a question, and uh, there is a question from Char Wilkins. He says, "Do I remember correctly that you told us that the smaller breaks meant that they're older than the larger breaks?" I uh, no, no, I didn't say that. I mean, I uh, myself confused because. I, I take always advice of my friends who are archaeologists who are into excavations. So when I found, I mean, when I discovered this tupa, I was over then because this, this, because I was expecting this, and when these people took me there, I was over when because exactly this is what Shrinjan says. So it took me a while to get into back into my like you know senses. I mean, I was like you know totally dumbstruck. I was totally dumbfounded. Like you know, I was totally numb. What happened? I mean, this is what Shrinjan says that it is here. So after that, I measured those bricks. Sizes and then I WhatsApp dip to my friend and then they immediately uh, responded that this uh, this could be anything from Shunga period to Kushana period. Mm. So I don't have any say. I don't. I'm not an archaeologist, so I don't have any say on what these bricks are. But my friends they say that, uh, and my friends uh, Sujit Nain is a very good archaeologist. So he says that. So I mean he's a very experienced archaeologist. So he says that. So and this mound is very big. I told you, you know when I saw this uh, mound, I was like you know. Totally dumbfounded. I didn't know how to react because uh, I was not. Uh, I mean, I so easily. I mean, I could <laughs> trace it. I was not expecting it to happen like you know so easily. Mm. So uh, so I'm I'm not I'm not claiming that small bricks are from ancient and brick bricks are this this. I don't know anything all of all those things. Yeah. Whenever I find any such thing, I just <laughs> send this to my friends in archaeology who are who are archaeologists. So two or three friends, they all of them they confirmed that this is from Shung and Kushan period. And I mean, these are on the surface. If you further dig, I mean, this is not the end of the. I mean, this this is not the last word. I mean, it is there. Anybody can go and do further excavation, exploration, and they can find many more many more things there. Because I was there hardly for half day. I didn't explore everything. I didn't measure everything, I, because it was raining and it was all water everywhere, and it was all forest. So I mean I didn't do very proper excavation. I mean not proper exploration. Uh, so I mean if somebody goes, then he can find something more also. We call it a recce, you know. <laughs> you just yeah. go there to check out to check out the place. <laughs> Now uh, there is a question, uh, Deepak. This is from uh, Rahul Gedam. He says, Deepak, oh, when was the last excavation that was done in any Buddhist sites in India? Excavation is going on every time. I mean, like you know, still I mean some excavations are going at many places. Buddhist sites are like you know, uh, excavation is I mean happening every year. I mean at some site at some Buddhist sites. Okay. Now we have a question from R Ricardo Sasaki, all the way from Latin America. <laughs> uh, as someone who has been following the pilgrimages and efforts of Deepak Ji for many years, I want to congratulate the immense love and dedication that you show. This is a legacy for many generations of Buddhists. Ah, there's a, a, a lovely comment from from you, Ricardo. Um, <laughs> Ricardo is old friend. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, there's a question from uh, Shantum Seth, who is actually going to be a speaker on this coming Sunday, and I'll say something about that at the end of this talk. Uh, his question is that you say that Fast Chen also visited Tilarok Court besides Suanzang. Didn't the Fast Chen visit? Piprawa and not Tilarakot. No, no, no. I mean, if they visited Piprawa, they should have mentioned about the relic stupa. Nobody, none of them have mentioned about the relic stupa. No, none of them. So, I mean, this is a whole confusion. And Fashian is not. A, I mean, I have put a story on this. I mean, I can. It's a very big explanation why. Uh, I mean, this uh, few Indian archaeologists they have used Fashian, but they have used very in a very limited way. I mean, if you see the complete Fashian story, so Fashian is wrong. I mean. So I mean, this is a, there's a story on the blog. I mean, it's a very big explanation. It's not uh, uh, we cannot finish it in 10 or 15 minutes. There's a story on my blog. I can uh, Santam sir is one of my patrons of this walk. He's one of the contributors. So thanks to him. So sir, uh, I, I will share with him. I will share with the, the story about uh, which I put on the blog about this uh, why Fashian is being misinterpreted. I mean, like you know, he's uh, he's being bad, uh, wrongly interpreted as. Uh, That he visited Piprava. No, he didn't visit Piprava because if he visited Piprava, he would have mentioned about the relic stupa. The central point of Piprava is the relic stupa. Buddha relics were there. How can this both this ardent Buddhist followers they can be silent about the relics of the Buddha? It's impossible. So, 
I don't think that uh, I don't think means I'm sure about it. I mean, it's uh, if you see that travel of uh, Fashian, it, it uh, at some point he's wrong. Like you know, his distance has been misinterpreted. I put this story on my blog. I mean, and so you can visit that story. Mm, okay. So all right, we almost come to the end of the talk. And I think we, uh, I would like on behalf of the Buddhist Gem Fellowship to express our thanks and appreciation to, uh, to Deepak for giving us such an interesting talk. And this is, uh, this is a discovery that is, that is opening many doors. It is really pop breaking because uh, you know, it is like opening uh, some new avenues for us, uh, for people who are really keen on, on pilgrimages all right, so thank you so much, uh, Deepak. And we hope to hear from you again, maybe it, uh, to tell us about more of your uh, you know, uh, future discovery. 